So we could do that, but because I was thinking about it last night, I thought, well, there really is another approach, and actually we have someone who's in our community who I think uh, could exemplify that in a certain way. And that's David Palmer, an educator who looked around and really wondered where the people he was educating were going to be employed at a level that would uh, support them, which he really wanted for his students, and we all want for our students. And so he did something quite creative about it. Uh, so I, I turned to him, and I wonder right now, I'd really love to see the data on what percentage of uh, massage sessions in a year happen in seated massage, what percentage of money that comes from the massage therapist's pockets comes through seated massage. I think he made a substantial difference in the uh, financial opportunities for massage therapists uh, in North America, probably in the whole world. So um, I'm going to say to you what I always have to say in this talk, which is I'm working from my notes here because if I speak extemporaneously, I will go off on a lot of tangents that I find really interesting. And even if you thought some of them were, we wouldn't get where we would get within the hour. So pardon me for using, using these notes. Um, so instead of in uh, changing, you know, about the change we're going to take is have a really clear idea of where things are going and where they are and where they seem to be going. Um, and I would say that President Obama and legislators who created the Affordable Care Act took a look and they saw some really scary things. And I'm going to give you as quick a look at the scary things as I possibly can uh, and suggest that if you want to know more, this particular book and you guys can all have these slides. Uh, I just never get them done until the night before, but I'm always happy to send them out, you know, the next day. So you can have these slides if you want, and, uh, um, you know, you are out for some reason came up in yellow and I couldn't get it to be readable, but it's there if you want this. It's a rich volume, and it is, as you can see, called U.S. Healthcare and International Perspective, Shorter Lives, Poorer Health. And so that's our situation. And now I'm going to give you just a few details on that. So um, the United States has a tendency to think that we're better than everything. So actually giving us a comparative look at where we stand could, if everyone were away, serve as a wake-up call. As it turns out, the extended Congress is still here. A lot, a lot of legislators say that we have the best health care on Earth. And that's probably true for the 1%. But for the rest of us, and for some people, we have no health care. Available yet, although that's what's being changed here. Okay, so these guys took a look at us in relation to uh, other administrations in particular. And what you see in this particular uh, slide is that uh, going on the vertical axis, you can see at birth, this is 2008, for people born in 2008. And what you've got going along the bottom is our total spending per capita. Um, and so here we are. We are an outlier in total spending. It costs us 75, in 2008, it cost us $7,500 a year to provide the health care that we're providing for a typical citizen. So given that we're spending so much, you would think that we would be doing really well in terms of life expectancy and a whole host of health measures, but in fact, we're not. The pain was doing pretty well, in fact, best. And they were doing it for about $2,500 a year. The only folks we were doing better than for our 7,500 bucks, we're Czechoslovakia, Poland, Mexico, Slovakia, Hungary, and Turkey. Not a great ROI, as they say. Okay. So, um, so here's another slide. Probability of survival to 50 in the 21 high-income countries from 1980 to 2006. And I put this, this was six years, this was to 2000. And I put this up here just to say, to the year 2008, from the last slide, that was not an outlier. That was the result of a steady progression in a downward direction. So I don't know what all these countries are, but they're those 21 high-income countries. We're the red country. So here you've got males, here you've got females. You can see that in 1980, we weren't doing great. We had a lower probability than most folks, but not everyone, of making it to 50 if we were born in those years. That's true for males, true for females. But really, by the time we get to 2005, we are the lowest folks on the block. And for females, for really quite a while, for over a decade, we're 
there's a chance, not in the whole world, but in the advanced world, in the money world. So, um, so how did that happen? Well, if you look at the chart, what you can see is that we actually kind of did a little bit better than we've been doing in 1980, and then we basically held our ground, but everybody else got better. They figured out something we didn't figure out about how to help the people live longer. So uh, that should be embarrassing, and more than embarrassing, it should be a prompt to action. Okay, so then if we're dying younger, where am I at least now that it's looking? So, uh, so people dying younger are not making it to 50 in higher proportions, then how is that happening? Why is that happening? And the answer is that we're doing it uh, because we're dying of um, non-communicable diseases. In fact, what we can see here is that we're second best in the world at dying from non-communicable diseases. <laughs> so, see, that's how they would talk about it in D.C. Anyway, we're second best, you know. Only Denmark is ahead of us. You know those. Scandinavians, they always yeah, so um, <laughs> see, this is why I'm not famous. Alright, so that's not something we want to be anywhere near the best at. So if we're not dying from the plague and not so much dying from TV, although the rate of TV is uh, increasing again in the US and other developed countries, then what is it that we're dying of? Well, the answer is, as you can see, uh, that we are dying basically from bad habits. And those would be collective policy level habits, like not giving a whole lot of people any health care when everybody, most other advanced countries in the world have figured out not only how to do that, we can figure out how, it's that they care enough to do it. Okay, so, and we're also dying of our individual habits. So we're dying of overeating, we're dying of over smoking. Uh, we're dying of under-exercising, we're dying of stressing each other out at the workplace <laughs> and home so that we have increased inflammatory and other diseases that you know, follow from stress. So that is really, uh, I would say, what our problem is. And it is a problem actually not just for adults. Uh, it's also a problem for children and that's a, that's a particularly sad thing. Um, so what you see here is that two organizations, fairly esteemed international organizations, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and UNICEF have both ranked the U.S. Uh, quite poorly in terms of seeing to the well-being of our children. Our children are dying of uh, neglect, they're dying of assault, violent assault, they're dying of, of, of accidental injuries at rates much higher than kids in other countries. That one just Totally sets me off, I gotta say. I do this. You know, this slide shows up in a number of my talks and it touches me every time. Okay, so that's what that's where we are. How do we get going somewhere else is part of the question. And so we take a look at again why we're there. And what we see in this slide is that alright, it takes a lot of things to get us at the absolute bottom where we are now. So it takes social factors and environmental factors and you have to really bump up the air and other things to create the levels of asthma that you know, we're experiencing. And those tend to be international problems because air travels. Um, you have to have your health system you know, organized in a way that isn't quite doing it for everybody. We have to have you know, poor individual behaviors as well. So it's both policy and social values that drive these things. And then you end up here with relatively uh, levels of morbidity and mortality, early mortality. So if we could go into it in that level of detail if we had a lot of time, we don't. In May, at the um, Foundation of International Massage Therapy Research Conference, Leslie Korn summed it up pretty uh, succinctly by calling it the paradox of progress. That everything we thought we were doing that was going to get us in a good place uh, somehow didn't, and that should really, really call our attention. This is the, you know, trash zone in the oceans of the world that we have in the country to see what everything else is. Okay, so that is the problem. At a glance, the question is how do we get out of it? And a part of the answer is that the Affordable Care Act, which was signed into law in 2010, was designed to be 
a major part of the answer to that. This is a law that was designed by people who really had their eye on what the problems are and were trying to figure out, all right, we got a sick care system, we want a health care system. That's a big change. How are we really going to do that? But as you know, um, we call the U.S. political system, legislative system, sausage making for a reason. And sausage making is never pretty. That was the prettiest picture I could find of sausage. <laughs> it never looks good. So, you know, the Affordable Care Act is uh, an imperfect law. But as imperfect as it is, it does still, to a really unprecedented degree, uh, offer some opportunities in general for people to have kinds of coverage that they haven't had yet, in general for there to be a focus on health promotion and disease prevention in a way that there hasn't been yet, and also to a really unprecedented degree, I would say it offers some opportunities for complementary and integrated health care, uh, and also reflects our values, I think, uh, more than we've seen in the past. So I'm now going to give you the speedy and uh, a speedy tour through the law, but there are going to be giant holes in the tour that I'm about to do. I'm not really going to focus so much on how we're getting more coverage for people. And if you've got a kid who's 18 to 26 or whatever, you can keep them, you know, on your health care, and everybody has access to certain things that they didn't before. And I'm not going to go there. Those things are central to what the law is about. It is about getting more coverage for people, and it is also about shifting our. Uh, our forms of payment, our paths of payment, so that we're incentivizing uh, actually taking care of people and keeping them from having to go to the hospital instead of the payment patterns we have now, which obviously pay hospitals more if people are getting there. So we're shifting. So I'm not going to go into the details of what we're shifting to. And there are a number of experiments going on because we're looking for how to, I mean, as a nation, we're looking for how to get ourselves out of the situation. And we need to look at what our part of potentially doing that is. So here are the parts of the law I want to call your attention. So one of them is uh, an organization that was created through the law called the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, the CORI. It is not a new branch of government. It's actually an independent organization, a non-governmental organization, but created and funded by this government. Its purpose is to assist patients and clinicians and policymakers and anyone else who has to make decisions about health care in making informed health care decisions by actually advancing the quality and most important the relevance of the kind of data, the kind of evidence that we're producing. So in a sense, it, uh, it, it has the potential to some extent to ask us to ask, to force us to ask for it give us money to ask uh, more relevant questions in our research for the end users of healthcare. What happens is you probably know, you know, think about all the uh, information we had about whether or not we should be taking calcium or vitamin D or uh, certain treatment, treatments for cancer and so forth over the years. And people are always going, wait, weren't they just saying this, but now they're saying that? You know, now they're saying we should take it, now they're saying we shouldn't take it. Remember what happens when you have a whole train of randomized clinical trials um, is that it's not that you could just spend more time with all those trials if you would know what the answer to your questions is about for like a person like me, which of these six different treatments, each of which is somewhat good, would actually be the best for a person like me. You won't know that for two reasons. One is that uh, those kinds of trials always report out averages, so they don't tell you who really, what kinds of people really benefit from this and what kinds of people don't benefit at all. They just keep telling you as a whole, as a population. But that doesn't answer the what about me or what about this client question. Um, and the other thing is, you never know which of them is better than another because you rarely have comparative effectiveness studies being done. Things are rarely compared to one another. They're always compared to uh, placebo and other kinds of things, which we can talk about at another time. So what Corey is supposed to do is actually help us understand how to make the questions we're asking, the outcomes we're looking at, more patient-relevant, 
more relevantly to our lives and how to conduct that kind of research uh, with real rigor, since it isn't what we've been concentrating on for the last uh, 100 or so years. Okay, so one of the other things that this law did that actually was quite good is that not just thought up the notion that we should have a patient centered outcomes research institute, but it figured out uh, how to fund it. And it created a way that there would be some ongoing funding, which is through these 1% one percent one dollar fees coming out of Medicare um, and private health insurance. So the punchline is down here, which is it started out relatively small because what they were doing was stacking up and beginning to set standards and things like that that don't cost a pile of money because they weren't giving out grants they were getting ready to. But now that we're in the grant giving phase. This year we're about 320 million for the budget by next year, and then an ongoing way will be at about 650 million dollars a year. That's not as big as NIH, but it's bigger than NCAM by about six fold the size of that camp. So it does uh, begin to get some serious money in the right direction, I would say. Okay, that's before I. Another organization that was created, or a body that was created by this law, is something called the National Prevention, Health Promotion, and Public Health Council. <coughs> So this council is actually, um, well, it was when it started 17 cabinet level folks. And, um, and now we've added three more. And so now it's 20, 20 departments of the government, the membership of the council, 20 cabinet level people. Their job, this is really what public health people call health in all policies. It's what the Integrated Healthcare Policy Consortium we call integrated healthcare policy, integrated policy. Meaning, we want people in the departments of uh, housing and urban development and transportation and agriculture and justice and the treasury and everybody across the government to be thinking about what the health implications for the nation are of the kinds of domestic policies they're putting in place or even promoting. Um, because everything we do has some implication for people's health, from what we're feeding kids in school lunch programs that are going to subsidize, to whether we build public housing with uh, walking paths nearby and public transportation coming to it, or whether we build it in a way that just forces more use of cars and more pollution in the air and less of in your body. Um, every aspect of domestic policy has some implications for the people's health, and this asks those folks to look at it. Oh, and I should say, here are, uh, uh, so those are the departments that are in part of the National Prevention, Health Promotion, and Public Health Council. Always referred to now as the National Prevention Council, unless I'm there, in which case I and now two other people say, yeah, right. okay. But if you're working in the realm of prevention, you're always trying to prevent something specific. You're trying to prevent uh, either a disaster tsunami or uh, whatever, or you're trying to prevent some diagnostic code from happening to a bunch of people. You're in an allopathic framework, you're in a diagnostic framework. If you're trying to prevent something, and you don't have to have a vision of health in order to prevent disease, because we know those diseases inside and out, because they're popping up all over the place. So if you are more in the realm of health promotion, you actually have to have a vision of health in order to promote it. Get some people somewhere where you gotta define what good looks like and really think about it and think about what gets in the way. So uh, so we really get the name, the nickname changed because the full name was good, but the references uh, limit our thinking. Okay. So just to say about the council, um, these are really its key intentions to shift from sickness care to health and wellness focus in what we're doing to search for structural rather than always biomedical approaches. Because biomedical approaches, again, are to things that are popping up in our diseases. But structural, social, environmental uh, approaches can make things not happen, bad things not happen, good things happen. Uh, and also, they are particularly looking at more coordination between clinical care and uh, community community and environmental aspects of health. So more between clinical and public health is their focus. Okay. These 20 people in these departments that have not mostly been thinking about the implications of their work for health for the last 10, 20, 50, 100 years ago, how long that department has existed, they've mostly been thinking about housing, their housing or 
farming, if they're in agriculture, or national parks, if they're in interior, or whatever their focus is. So uh, in order to help them think about um, health, they were given an advisory group that has an even longer name. So this is the advisory group on prevention, health promotion, and integrative and public health. Because they do understand in D.C. that integration is a good thing, because integration is coordination. And sometimes they just think that means your primary care person talking to your orthopedist or even to his or her own nurse. But increasingly they understand that it's the integration of um, conventional, complementary, and alternative health care. So, um, okay, so the name of the advisory group is that name. The advisory group can be up to 25 people. We stand at about 22 at this point. Uh, the presidential appointees, which uh, is the good news and the bad news, because as you can imagine, during the last election, we weren't doing anything except waiting to see if we were going to still be alive at the end of the election or gone with the wind. Um, but the law also specified what the skill sets and the experience sets of those total those 25 people should be collectively, and it stipulated that at least some of those people should be uh, licensed integrated healthcare practitioners. I think it said integrated, I don't think it said complementary. But anyway, um, oh yeah, including integrated health practitioners. This is exactly what it said. And so uh, some of us are, and, uh, and I was appointed to that body. And you know, you always think what you're doing has real potential. So, you know, I think this body has real potential. And I think the potential, it's, let me just say about DC, if you're on an advisory board, you have no power except power of persuasion. If you're an advisor, people can take your advice or leave it. They can read your memo or not even read it and tell what the advice would have been. That can happen. Um, but you've been asked to advise them, so there is actually communication, in this case anyway. Between, between the levels, and we are now organized, have organized ourselves into a number of working groups, one of which is the Integrated Healthcare Working Group, uh, which I chair, and which I open by saying to people, uh, okay, so if the usual suspects show up to be on this committee, like the three integrated people and none of the public health people, we're going to close the committee, because that's not the conversation that needs to take place. And so in fact, we have the heads of public health for Los Angeles County and for the city of Cambridge and for the state of Massachusetts, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and a number of other people on this committee so that conversations can begin to happen. And I, I would say to you that that's something that this body could take on, actually, because there is a conversation between public health and clinical care, particularly among the SACS campus, um, and other complementary alternative medicine professions that has never happened. I mean, when I went to school anyway, went to PMTI. That's a good school. I went to actually a number of some schools, but a month of them. And uh, and although I was socialized in many ways to be a massage therapist and a clinician and a healer, I was not so much socialized to understand myself as part of the healthcare system and even beyond that really to think of myself as part of a public health system. That really wasn't happening. So only you know whether that is happening now more than it was in the 80s when I went to PMTI. It certainly wasn't happening in the 60s when I was at the Essen Institute. So, um, <laughs> so it isn't happening. We can talk about that. <laughs> so, um, so only you know if you really have your students thinking about the bigger thing that they are part of, bigger even than this profession, even bigger than healthcare delivery direct, directly, but into public health. I think it's important. I mean, I, uh, um, you know, we see more of a person's skin. Probably even than their lovers in terms of with the lights on and daylight and stuff. <laughs> so we ought to really be the front line or one front line in terms of uh, skin abnormality identification and referral. And many of us do notice things, I think. I mean, I have, I've sent clients to go see their primary care provider and get that checked out. Um, we've had that happen with our own family to have someone to get it checked out, and it's a good thing that it was checked out. So we do that, but we don't often have 
have a, we don't have the channels yet to really be doing that on a large scale and to be referring to the people that really maybe they should be seeing. And also there's a huge difference between saying to somebody, you ought to have that checked out and actually making a referral to someone who's expecting to receive referrals from you. And these things could be set up and, you know, skin care is just one issue. So think about what else would it mean for us to really engage with public health folks and say, how can we do this better together? All right, see? Okay, so one of the things that they did was create a national prevention strategy, all right, prevention, health promotion, and public health strategy, really, and, um, and this is important, actually, because it means that we do have a, a vision of where we're going, and it's the first time that this country has actually had a prevention strategy, we just had a cleanup after the fact strategy uh, so far, so this is a good Good thing. And the strategy uh, has four key elements to it, to create healthy and safe uh, community environments, to get more coordination between clinical and community, oh, I can't even read it up there, preventive services, uh, to focus on elimination of health disparities, which is obviously a huge part of what puts us at the bottom, because we have gaps and have lots in this country in a way that many countries don't, and to have more empowered people. Okay, and those four strategies which guide their decisions about what to do are supposed to be aimed at what's in the center, which if you can't read it says to increase the number of Americans who are healthy at every stage of life. And then going around here we've got seven kind of focuses, strategic focuses that might get us there. Um, so one of the things I want to say is that, uh, well I did just say, so I got to do it now which is that we really do need to get in this conversation about um, how to work with the public health folks. The other thing I want to say is that if you look at that strategy, um, the weak area in that strategy, and from my perspective, is actually empower people. Because there's a lot of focus on giving people information. And, you know, pamphlets are cheap, and these will be tossed away. And so what we need is, if, I mean, information is critical for people, uh, we're hoping everybody knows that they shouldn't be smoking now. But there's a whole lot of other stuff that people really don't know about how to take care of themselves. But even beyond that, we know people need encouragement. Changes at the level that we're talking about are really hard to make. And so I think that our profession, which engages pretty deeply with every client, which can't be said of every healthcare profession, will have things to say to these folks about how you really help people make the change. How you help people feel good enough about themselves and good enough in themselves to sustain that kind of change. So, um, so that's what I think about that aspect of the strategy. It could be strengthened. Okay, so great to have a strategy, but nothing's going to happen unless you have an action plan. And they developed an action plan, and this particular action plan has 200 specific <coughs> actions that those 17 at the time agencies have committed to over the next few years. Um, and we're not going to go into this because we don't have time, but you could. All of these things you can download for free uh, from the government website, and if anybody wants that information, just let me know. So the Prevention of the Public Health Fund, this council and the advisory group and so forth, were given the fund that was also put in the law. It's, it turns out, I mean, I'm still learning how you do this policy stuff. Um, and it turns out that if you don't build the funding into a law, these days we got a Congress, more than half of which will decide not to fund it just because they want to like trip you up. So, or we just they don't like that particular idea <coughs> just because they want to trip you up. Okay, so there was a fund, it's pretty big, um, but this fund has had, I think at this point, 36 specific uh, attempts on the part of Congress to either take a big chunk of it and use it for something that has nothing to do with that. Student loan rate was a thing that got argued over, or, or something else. So millions of dollars disappear periodically from this fund. And um, so what I want to say here about this whole National Prevention Council advisory group fund is that it's not everything we wanted when we were arguing about how the law should be written, but it's got a lot more good than not in it. It is a strong step in the right direction. It is seriously and continuously under assault 
that may be even more true now that the Supreme Court has given their answer, so activity of the courts to defeat the law is declining. And this is really worthy of protection and periodically if we figure out a way to have policy communications as a group, we may be saying this would be a good day to click here and send your representative a message to try to keep this in place because they're at it again. Okay, next. Uh, okay, so the next thing I want to call your attention to is another body created through this law, which is called the uh, National Healthcare Workforce Commission. Its job, as you can see, was to uh, look at what the workforce that we have is, what our goals in relation to health are, and therefore what the workforce that we need is. And, um, and given the workforce that we need, what are the barriers to improve coordination at federal, state, and local levels to really having and appropriately deploying that workforce. Uh, and to the extent that we can't do that with the workforce we have or the systems that we have now, then one of the innovations that need to take place. That was the job of the, of the is the job of the National Healthcare Workforce Commission. Um, and uh, they also, in that section of the law, define the National Healthcare Workforce. And they did it by putting in all the usual, you know, pharmacists, dentists, hygienists, blah, blah, blah. But they also put in for the first time in U.S. history, anyway, licensed complementary and alternative medicine providers and integrated health practitioners. Okay, not so easy always to figure out who's an integrated health care practitioner who would be in or out. Reiki, yes, no, healing touch, yes, no, you know, your local crystal person, which I am one, so I'm not making fun, but yes or no. So that's hard, but licensed complementary and alternative medicine providers, not hard to define. So uh, good that we are licensed almost everywhere, better that we are licensed absolutely everywhere. Um, here's the, so that's the good news about the commission. The bad news about the commission is that this is an aspect of the Affordable Care Act that did not have an appropriation built into the law. It actually doesn't need much money, they're not grand dealing or anything. But they were going to commission some studies in order to be smart about what their tasks were. And, uh, and so Congress did not see fit to appropriate anything for this commission. So they were appointed, smart people, duly appointed in 2010, uh, have not had so much as a phone call among them in the last three years because there's no money. So that's, uh, that's, that's the not beautiful part about Washington. Okay. Um, and I don't say that like it's completely dead. We can be doing things. And it was Bernie Sanders who put this into the law and that definition into the law. Thank you, Bernie. And he's still kind of on the case. And so we're, we're looking for where, you know, you're looking for like a moving train, a law that's going to get passed, a bill that's going to get passed, and then you try to slip that in again with some money. So I'll let you know if that happens. Okay. So another uh, thing, another aspect of this law that might not have come. Uh, called your attention was the creation of uh, freestanding birth, birthing centers, um, coverage for them, a change in reimbursement for midwives, among other folks. And I call this to your attention for two reasons, and I'm not outlining here every change in what advanced practice nurses are allowed to do is that came through this law, and a number of changes did come through this law for, for nurses. And, these two are professions we can look to for how you get stuff done because they really got themselves, especially the midwives. I mean, they got themselves organized when this law was being written in a way that we did. Just as an example. So, um, so we have a lot to learn from these folks, but I also have it up here because these are people that can now be employing you. It would be now not the docs so much, but the midwives who can make decisions about whether or not to. Uh, um, have the size of us on their teams, either at the birthing centers or at the uh, home delivers that they're able to do. So I just mentioned that as an income potential. Okay. That's uh, almost the end of my tour. What I want to say is that there are three important provisions in this law that I haven't mentioned yet, um, important, I think, for integrated health care that are being determined mostly at the state level. So everything that I just went through uh, it happens pretty much at the federal level. It happened in the law, and now, you know, the 
urban center that gets implemented locally, but nothing is going to change about the law. States, well, there's probably some integration with existing state law that has to go on. But although this is a federal law, scope of practice, as you know, is set at the state level. And a lot of decisions about health care are set at the state level. And for that, and also for political reasons, this administration hunted a certain amount of decision making to the state level which means uh, all the good and bad of uh, the variation that you can get. And you've got uh, 50 states in Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia figuring it out for themselves exactly how they're going to do it. Sometimes I think those are beneficial, naturally arising experiments. And sometimes I think we could be better coordinated than that, but we aren't. OK, so I'm going to take you through these three now. Um, the first of which is uh, patient-centered medical home. So what we have here is the um, establishment or the potential <coughs> for primary care providers to establish themselves as patient-centered medical homes supported by community-based interdisciplinary interprofessional teams. So those could be places that we are uh, appearing. We aren't yet in those states. Most states are going to define these interprofessional teams at least in Vermont, where we've been doing this for a number of years prior to the, uh, to the passage of uh, the Affordable Care Act, we had something called the Blueprint for Health, which established patient-centered medical homes throughout the state. Uh, and most of them have like a nutritionist and a PT and, and a healthcare navigator or something. And that's the extent of the integration that we're seeing now. So this is to call your attention to the fact that if you want your state to look better than that, uh, you're going to have to look at it. You're going to have to go be where those decisions are, are being made. And those decisions will be being made, I think, in an ongoing way. This is not a once and for all decision at the state level. But a place to start is with your uh, insurance commissioner. So. to establish their essential benefits actually has passed, although not all states are, uh, are done with it anyway. Um, essential benefits are the, do you guys know all this stuff, or I'll just say it, the essential benefits are what uh, states are determining. Every health plan that's going to appear on their health care exchange, you know about the exchanges, right, um, will have to include, okay? And so, on the one hand, the federal government made some decisions about that. They said, well, every state has to include these things in their essential benefits. But then how you include them, what you mean by, you know, we're going to cover rehabilitative and rehabilitative services, or, you know, at what level you're covering prescription <coughs> drugs, or how you deliver mental health services, and so forth. There could be variation on all those things across states. So that's what um, was, and to some extent, and in some locations still is, being hammered out in terms of essential benefits. And again, it was pretty much the insurance commissioners across states that were doing that, but not in every state. Some states set up special committees. So this was one of those places where, honestly, we were going to be organized as a community to do this. Um, we would have to be feeding information back and forth about where it's happening in your state, who you should be contacting. But then there could be, you know, talking points about what to be working on. I'm just beginning to say there would be a way we could be coordinated about policy as a profession that we aren't yet, uh, and that I think it would be good for us to do. So, um, okay. So one of the things that happened in some states was that they did include, specifically include, um, complementary and alternative health care providers, usually one profession would be named, and that would be because that profession got itself together and either had strong schools or a strong lobby in some way and managed to get themselves there. When I go back and look at this list and I think, well, where could we be? I think, well, we could be in the patient services. You know, we could be in rehabilitative services. We could be in preventative and wellness services and chronic disease management. 
I mean, there are obvious places for us to be, uh, but we would have to first be organized and politically minded and doing it to get there. But anyway, it could happen. Okay, so I want to move on to the third of the things that I was saying um, happens at the state level, and also to say that some of these, the opening of the healthcare exchanges, which is where those essential benefits will be expressed in the uh, insurance plans that people are choosing from when they go to those websites. That and this section, 2706, which is the non-discrimination in the healthcare section. So there's non-discrimination like you can't be moved out of an insurance plan because you have a pre-existing condition or because you just hit the limit on what we're willing to pay for you or sorry, you're still not well. Um, so those kinds of discrimination, patient-level discrimination, got taken care of in other sections of the law. This section of the law says, as you can see, that a group health plan and a health insurance issuer offering group or individual health plans shall not discriminate. Shall, you know, in uh, legal language you get may and shall. May means optional. Shall means not optional. You shall not. Discriminate with respect to participation under the plan or coverage against any health care provider who's acting within the scope of that provider's license or certification under applicable state law. Meaning, if you're covering certain kinds of things and you're paying PTs, you're reimbursing PTs to do it for people with, you know, car accidents or whatever, musculoskeletal pain, and those things are within the scope of practice for massage therapists in your state and certain patient people want to use a massage therapist, you've got to reimburse that massage therapist. That is what the language of that law means. Not everyone's determining it that way, but it is what the congressional intention was, and it is what the literal language of the law says. Okay, the law also says a few other things. It says that it doesn't require a group health plan or insurance issuer uh, to contract with every any healthcare provider. So it means you don't have to have every massage therapist in the state among the people that you're reimbursing. It's not an every willing provider law, that's what that would be called. But you have to cover some. In fact, you should cover enough. There is a concept called network advocacy where you have to give your patient population access to reasonable access to it. Okay. So it says you don't have to contract with any healthcare provider, and it also says down here that rates can vary. Based on quality and performance measures, there can be varying reimbursement rates. So, okay, you don't have to pay an MP the same as a PT, you don't have to pay an MP the same as an MP, just because they're doing the same thing, basically, in the scope of practice. But you have to include them. That's what that law says. This section of the law, again, doesn't go into effect until January 2014, which is why we've been really running at heels around trying to get it well understood because you know you've got the country and insurers and also state officials trying to understand this thousand page law. This page didn't stand out for them. They didn't really look at that yet because it's just a little blip in the big thousand pages and um, and it, they don't have to create something to do it like the healthcare exchanges in your state, but my state, we're, we're spending a lot of money trying to create that and work that really works for people. So it's reasonable that people haven't had their attention here, but we are trying to call people's attention here um, because we're trying to say, hey, you can get those healthcare exchanges and you have your essential benefits and your rules for plans that can be included or not included in it, but you're not, they're not planning to cover all healthcare professionals who are operating within their scope of practice and doing things that uh, that you're reimbursing other folks for that you aren't covering in your plan. You're covering. You know, this doesn't mean we get in there and our whole scope of practice is covered. It just means if you are covering something and that is within our scope of practice, you have to cover us to do it as well. If we go on to do six other things that are not in the essential benefits that you are offering through those plans, you don't have to cover us for those things just because we got some other good ideas about what would help this person. You don't have to cover us for that. Clear? Sort of? Okay, so um, 
So I like this section a lot. I don't like it as well as the language of the Internet Healthcare Policy Consortium had submitted, trying to get it in a lot. This is one of the sausage parts here. But nonetheless, I like it pretty well because it affirms the authority of states and territories in the United States to set a scope of practice within their jurisdiction to regulate healthcare practices within their jurisdiction and decide what they're covering and what they're not. Um, it affirms the healthcare practitioner's rights and also responsibility to be able to practice to the extent of our scope. It begins that conversation anyway. Um, and it also acknowledges that Americans have, been, uh, have already voiced their desire to have access to qualified practitioners on the whole continuum of conventional complementary and alternative uh, providers, and we ought to be uh, allowing them to do it. So we like that. So what many of them have been doing for the last bunch of months is trying to let states know that their essential health benefits packages have to accommodate this element of the law as well. And we, um, it's going to take you through the last six fights about this with DHHS. And we've been trying to get the Health and Human Services to issue guidance that would make it very clear what to do. They issued some really poor guidance. We've been in conversation with them. It's the way it goes. You have to fight for what you want. So, okay, so, um, so again, this part of the law, during the point at which the Affordable Care Act was a bill and not a law in the past year, the AMA was really active, getting this section of the law taken out. We had to keep reading what the current bill was because they would take out the section and then we would go back to Senator Harkin's office or somebody else's office, but he was really the champion here, and get that section put back in and then, you know, on and on. Okay, then the law passed, and you think like, okay, it's law now, guys. Let's just you know shake hands and move forward with the law we got. No, so they still try it. I mean, every year the AMA passes in their House of Delegates a resolution to kill this section of the law. So, um, so <clears throat> anyway, one of the things that this section of the law is similar to, it's not identical to, but similar to. So the only precedent I think we really have to draw on in terms of anticipating what will come forward after the uh, January 1st, 2014, is looking at the state of Washington, uh, where they have the, um, every category, not every willing provider, but every category of provider law. And that is what brought um, the five licensed complementary and alternative medicine professionals <laughs> in the state of Washington. And they've been working with this, or you if you're from Washington, have been working with this for about 15 years. And that law was challenged intensely at the beginning. People tried to kill the whole law. They went through a number of court trials. But there are also insurers who tried to put caps on you know, dollar amounts of coverage for us, but not for other kinds of providers. You know, that got, they got told they couldn't do that. They would not have, you know, like, yeah, we got, you know, one acupuncturist. And the acupuncturist moves to Bellingham, Washington. Oh, you can't drive to Bellingham, Washington? Do that. So, you know, so you get rules about things that need to be covered. And so we've been feeding this information about Washington's experience to people in DHHS, hoping that they would issue guidance that would uh, prevent us from having to go through the legal trouble and delay and cost. We're not there yet. Or we're not. Okay. So that's this. We can talk about it more later. I'm moving on to one other thing. Hoping I'm not over time yet. Okay, so I want to say, when we're thinking about the kinds of transformation going on in this country, uh, Department of Defense just might be your new best friend, because there is more going on, both within the Department of Defense, also to some extent the VA, but even more DOD, there's more experimentation, and not so much experimentation, just embracing the use of complementary and alternative medicine than you're seeing anywhere else in the government, because it works. And this is, DOD is like the largest, most practical employer in the country. They have a workforce that they have to deploy, the workforce has to be functioning well, mentally and physically, they have to be functioning well, and so they've just been looking for like, what do we give these people so that they can go do their job? So whenever you think about what their job is, that's their question. How do we keep them going? And so, um, and so that's partly on the battlefield, like battles of acupuncture, and it is also um, back home. So, uh, not the thing. Okay, 
So what we see is popping up in a whole lot of um, bases. Uh, they're looking now, as people are coming back, for ways to address traumatic brain injury, uh, PTSD, other things that people are coming, and intense musculoskeletal problems because of what they've been lugging around through the sand and over mountains for the last 10 years. People are coming from hurting. My research right now is all with veterans and their partners. I'm, I'm pretty familiar with what they're coming home with. It's, uh, and as a country, we're not quite ready for it yet. We need to get ready. Okay, so they've been looking for how to help people with PTSD and hyperarousal, and this is what they think helps, including us. So, uh, so another place for people to think in terms of potential workplaces for you, for your students, for whomever. Okay, another thing I want to tell you that's happening is now we're done with the DOT, we're done with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I just want to call your attention to one bill that is now uh, will soon be in play. It's been put forward, it's taken some amendments uh, at some play. And uh, this is a bill coming forward from the uh, Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs. And the point of the bill, so it's Senate Bill 852, and you may be hearing from me about it when it's time for there to be action on it. And the goal of the bill is to approve the health care first by the Department of VA by increasing access to complementary and alternative medicine and other approaches to wellness and preventive care and for other purposes. And that's the whole point of the bill. And it began with language that actually would have, because of how it was inadvertently written, made it impossible for a doc who's duly trained to actually work under that. It said that it was for people whose, were, whose practice was solely the provision of complementary and alternative medicine. But we went back in and we got that uh, tweet so that there could be duly trained people as well, but still with language that emphasizes solely providing complementary and alternative medicine, um, because otherwise it's too easy for us to be squeezed out. Okay, one last thing that's been uh, happening is, uh, so there's an organization called JCO, the Joint Commission uh, on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations which is like the good housekeeping skill approval for hospitals. But they are hospitals, they're nursing homes, they're mental hospitals. I mean, they've got a huge terrain. This, like the Corey, like the Institute of Medicine, is not a branch of government. This is an independent nonprofit to which the government has actually given increasing powers uh, for standard setting. And so uh, a couple of months ago, uh, they have had for years standards on pain management for hospitals and for all those institutions I mentioned. And a couple of months ago, some folks from the Consortium of Academic Health Centers of Integrated Medicine, so that's the med school counterpart to AHEC, um, went to JCO and said, hey, you guys, your pain management standards for hospitals are like intentionally pharmacocentric and thus highly out of date because you act as though you haven't read any of the literature on non-pharmacologic interventions for pain management that that's come forward in the last 20 years. And they said, geez, we didn't really mean to be pharmacocentric. We, maybe we were just too vague about the other stuff. But anyway, what they've agreed to do now is uh, do a full review and redo their standards on pain management in hospitals. And so a woman named Arya Nassi, who's at uh, Beth Israel Hospital, their integrated medicine program, Center for Health and Healing. She oversees their acupuncture fellowship. She reviewed all the acupuncture literature, relevant hospitals, and sent it to them. I reviewed all the massage literature, I think, I hope, I tried, relevant to hospital applications, pre post surgical, NICU, whatever, trouble sleeping, everything that would serve in your uh, massages for hospital staff and what that means in terms of the patient's environment and the hospital. I mean, I don't know. We covered a lot of it and have submitted it to them. We're months away, but I think we're only months away from uh, from them initiating that process and going through it. They are right now uh, pulling their review committee together, and we are right now suggesting CAM folks who could be sitting on that review committee. So I feel hopeful about that. I feel hopeful that that could actually lead to changes in hospitals, especially if each profession is ready to really help hospitals understand better than they do now, in more departments than they do now, how to credential folks in. Okay. 
So here's where I think we are in a way. You know, there are doors opening. Are we going through those doors or are we getting left in the dust? I mean, that is the question. I will say in relation to the Affordable Care Act as a profession, pretty dusty. You know, the, just not makes too many times <laughs> one point I'm trying to make, but that train is way out of the station and we are, you know, trying to run faster than it to get to the next station and get our point in so that we can get cut. We're late on the affordable care. The laws are supposed to be there when they're being designed even before they get voted on. And I'm not waiting until it's not good to wait until January of 2014 to begin looking at the non-discrimination section. Feel confident. Um, 
And I'm hiring someone who comes up with a diploma. What does that person really know? What are they really good at? So, and the most disconcerting, I'd say, is the lack of understanding by the Sasha, by the recent graduates, um, of common clinical language and clinical protocol. So that there's a whole other kind of training that uh, many clinical contexts would have to do to take our students in, or take us in, those of us who go to schools where none of us was taking thought about at that time, in those days. So, uh, okay, so that's a problem. And this, I think that there's another problem, which is getting in each other's way. I now live in one of the unregulated states, and it's not the lack of trying. A couple of us tried really hard a few years ago to get licensure legislation passed in Vermont, but you have to pass a, whatever, a sunrise application, you know, where you show that there'd be harm to the public if, you, if we were not a regulated state or a regulated profession. And we thought we did a slam bang job of that. And everything was going through the and Secretary of State's office said, yeah, yeah, they're going to, you know, we'd be there. And then just a couple of days before the decision making happened, a whole school of the staff who had not been part of the public hearings, had not come to the public hearings, people had been notified, hadn't come to the public hearings, showed up and said, this is going to kill us financially. A lot of small businesses are going to go out if you pass this law. Why? Because they didn't need the bill, so they didn't know actually, and of course they'd be grandparented in. I mean, it came from ignorance and fears. Um, so that was problematic. And then they also said, the quality control issue that you're talking about, the market place takes care of that. Well, I can tell you that when I moved up to Vermont from DC, you know, I had to lie on a lot of people's tables before I found people that were worth going back to for a second time, let alone anything regular. The market had not taken care of people who were clearly uh, shouldn't have been hanging out of jail. I don't know if they were doing harm, but they weren't doing anything. Okay, so we did in each other's way, is my point, as a profession. And so there are a lot of people who are really concerned about um, that they don't want to take insurance, they don't want to get caught in that, they know what psychotherapist said, which is it's really bad, and then you get some stranger. 20 towns away or maybe in Mumbai telling you how many sessions you can do in that, you know, client and they don't want to go anywhere near it. And so they're going to say we should go there. And I feel like most you should go there if you don't want to deal with those problems. Those are real problems. We can deal with them. But if you don't want to do that, let's figure out a way that you don't have to and I still can. Or somebody who wants to still can. So we can be so great and we really need to figure our way out of that. And so uh, I think what I want to do if we have any time left now is turn it over to you to say, you know, what are your eyes on? This is Wayne Greg, his eyes are always on the pocket where it's gonna be. What are your eyes on? What are the leaders of this profession? They've been unpaid, formal and informal leaders of the profession. You know, where are our eyes? What are we planning for? I just want to start that conversation with you, and I'm glad to have been able to be here and start it. Let's continue. Do we have any time for questions, or am I like two minutes? Two minutes, did you say? We started late, didn't we? is one of interprofessionalism. So as educators, we need to be educating students for interprofessional practice. So I'm just, I apologize for not leaving more time. And I hope that we will find time in the next uh, day and a half or whatever we have left to talk. I will still be here. If any of this interests you, let me know. I will be putting together uh, a list of folks who actually care about policy stuff and want to figure out a way to move us forward on that. And we will then find them for us to do that. Thank Are you. Want to you can start the discussion there.
Vamos para o 